this week on the Back Table Podcast. You know, I know many people are fascinated by the notion that I can do the surgery awake and send them home in four hours. But to me, it's going to be really interesting when I can really modulate the experience of the surgery itself so that patients come out and they feel like they had a great time. Let's say they were watching a virtual reality headset while they're having their spine surgery. That to me is the is what we're driving towards now. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Backtable Podcast, your home for all things interventional and otherwise minimally invasive. You can find all previous episodes of our podcasts on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and all other major podcast platforms. Feel free to reach out to us on social media with suggestions about how we can improve the podcast and bring more valuable resources to the interventional community. This is your host, Jacob Fleming. I'm a radiology resident in Dallas, Texas, and today, I'm enthused to welcome to the show orthopedic su- spine surgeon, Alok Sharan, Dr. Sharan. Uh, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thanks for having me on. Thank you for coming on. And I have to say the goal of this show is to talk about everything that's the latest and greatest in MSK fields, inclusive of radiology, orthopedics, spine surgery, neurosurgery, and everything. And I can't really think of a better way to start than talking about awake spine surgery, which I think is a topic that uh, grabs a lot of ears right off the bat. And so I'm excited to dive into this topic today. So Dr. Sharon, before we begin, just tell us a bit about your background, your origin story, getting into medicine, and when you knew that you needed to be a spine surgeon. Sure. Thank you. No, I appreciate that. I'm an orthopedic spine surgeon. I've been in practice now for about 16 years. I'm currently in private practice in New Jersey, but it didn't start out that way. I did my college at Boston University. I was actually a political science major. And then I decided that I wanted to go into medicine because I enjoyed the ability to impact and help people. I went to medical school in New Jersey, residency in upstate New York, fellowship in, in NYU. And I started my career off in academic medicine at a wonderful academic hospital called Montefiore in the Bronx. <laughs> and it was a wonderful experience for me. I had a chance to really take care of people with severe back problems who needed spine surgery. And towards the tail end of my time at Montefiore, I realized that I wanted to get a healthcare MBA, which I did. I got a healthcare MBA at Dartmouth, and it was around the time that Obamacare had passed and things were being implemented, and I realized that healthcare was changing. And so at that time, I realized that I didn't want to be in academic medicine anymore, and then made the shift to private practice. So it's sort of interesting in that I got this great healthcare MBA and ended up not going into academics, which is really sort of the opposite of what most people think. But it's been an incredible ride since then. That's really interesting. I'm sure your backgrounds uh, in the healthcare administration definitely gives you very interesting insight into this particular topic, which has a lot of advantages outside of just uh, a single patient kind of doing well. And so with, with that said, Let's let's get sort of a 40,000 foot view of what is awake spine surgery. Right. So at a very high level, awake spine surgery is using local and regional anesthesia to perform low back surgery. Not neck surgery, but low back surgery. And in my mind, what awake spine surgery represents is just the notion of not using general anesthesia and being able to really just precisely numb up the area that needs surgery, that area in particular. But then along with it, the whole notion of awake spine surgery is that by avoiding general anesthesia, by using just local and regional anesthesia, we're able to mobilize patients quicker and get them out of pain quicker so that their recovery is fast. We'll get into the details later, but at this point now, a spinal fusion surgery, which normally results in patients staying in the hospital for about two, three days, and there are narcotics for four to six weeks. At this point now, when we do an awake spinal fusion, takes us about an hour, hour and a half to do, and patients stay in the hospital for four hours, they go home the same day, and they're on narcotics for only about four days. Wow. So the notion of awake spinal fusion at a high level is using local and regional anesthesia to do the surgery, but the truth be told is it's really just a protocol that allows patients to recover faster, mobilize quickly, and get out of pain quickly. Very nice. And so uh, this reminds me of when I was in med school and intern year rotating on the general surgery services, a lot of the uh, so-called ERAS protocols, early return after surgery. This is a very similar concept. And I also relate to this a lot because in the IR world, a vast majority of our patients were intervening on 
we use either uh, moderate sedation or local anesthesia. And of course, most of our procedures are pretty minorly disruptive of the tissue. And so I'm really fascinated by this because it's using those similar kind of concepts to do something which is quite a bit more complex, which is a, a lumbar uh, inner body fusion. That's pretty amazing. So let's hear a little bit about your current practice and uh, what was the impetus to begin offering awake spine surgery? How'd you go about it? Were there any individuals or specific practices that were an inspiration for you? Great question. You know, the truth is that it was really a confluence of events that came together. About 10 years ago, I was involved in a great research study where we were looking at the effects of general anesthesia on individuals who are older than 65 undergoing orthopedic surgery, hip replacement, knee replacement, spine surgery. And it was quite alarming, just didn't really appreciate this, but the patients who had undergone general anesthesia after orthopedic surgery had developed a higher rate of delirium as opposed to individuals who had, let's say, spinal anesthesia. And that was alarming for me because um, delirium, as you know, is a significant problem. At a personal level, I felt it because my father had undergone heart surgery around the, around the time. So I saw intimately what happens when you develop delirium. And I thought that was concerning because, you know, as we're trying to mobilize patients quicker, get them, let's say, perhaps out of the hospital quicker, what was alarming was that patients who were undergoing general anesthesia were developing delirium, and it increased significantly at post-op day one, which meant that we were basically doing surgery on individuals, discharging them home perhaps the same day, and not realizing that we're sending them home with the chance of them having delirium. And of course, there are tremendous um, collateral damages that can develop when you have delirium. So it was around that time that my anesthesiologist and I, who I work with closely, said, you know what? Maybe we should start doing more spine surgery without general anesthesia. It's been described before, but it was also fortuitous that around that time, there was a very prominent individual in our hospital who needed spine surgery and has specifically asked for his spine surgery to be done without general anesthesia. And so we did it and everything worked out fine. It was beautiful. And I realized at that point that you could do spine surgery without general anesthesia and the patients can do perfectly fine. It's really exciting to hear about. I mean, it seems like often these things, we, we get so kind of ingrained in our protocol and way of doing things. Spine surgery is, in a lot of people's mind, kind of this big, serious operation. And so obviously that goes with general anesthesia. And then a single event of saying, okay, let's, let's try this differently and see how it goes can really start to change the paradigm. Absolutely. And I think that for medicine to advance further, we can't be afraid of change. You know, what was interesting was when we first started doing awake spine surgery, we started doing it on the simple cases, laminectomies, discectomies. And I soon thereafter went to, um, I changed jobs and went to work at a private hospital and work with a progressive group of anesthesiologists who had been doing ERAS and other specialties. And as I was doing my spinal fusion surgeries under general anesthesia, we were, you know, getting faster, more efficient. One of the anesthesiologists said, why aren't we doing spinal fusion surgery under spinal anesthesia? And to be honest with you, I said, no. I did a literature search, tried to figure out whether or not it's been done. It had not, or at least it had been published. And at the time she said, why don't we do our spinal fusion surgeries under spinal anesthesia? And I said, let's do our spinal fusion surgery under spinal anesthesia. <laughs> and that was really one of the first awake spinal fusions that we, that we did. And it's been remarkable since then. That's fantastic. And so talking about spinal fusion surgery is kind of interesting because obviously not all fusions are the same. We've got, of course, T-lift, P-lift, A-lift, all kinds of different lifts. And I think every surgeon has their preferred workhorse and, and certain of the operations work better in, in certain cases. And so break it down a little bit further for us, uh, which of the uh, lumbar inner body fusion operations are you performing and, and which ones are off the table either for obvious anatomic reasons or, or something that might be a little bit more nuanced? I'll tell you my preference for how to do the interbody fusion, and then I'll tell you how my eyes have been open to the fact that you can do so many procedures awake. So my preference is to do a T-lift surgery, which is essentially going from the back of the spine and fusing, let's say, two levels, L4 and L5. So I do the T-lift. I do that less invasively, minimally invasively with small incisions, and we do that under spinal anesthesia. And that works out really well because the patients are prone for about an hour and a half. They can handle that really well. So that's my procedure of choice. Now, what's been interesting is that as, as I've published and spoken more about awake spine surgery, I've been contacted from people all across the world. And one thing I've learned now is that you should never say this can't be done because I have a colleague in Italy 
who's very facile at doing the X-Lift procedure, which is essentially doing a fusion while the patient's on their side, and he does them awake. Wow. So he does the awake X-Lift procedure. And it's sort of interesting how that story came about. During COVID, they got hit really hard in Italy. He was very proficient at doing the X-Lift procedure and told his anesthesiologist, we can avoid intubation, which we know is really critical during COVID. Why don't we do the X-Lift under spinal? And they did. And now he's done over 150, 200 of these cases. And so I've learned now that there's probably really no procedure that he can't do awake in the lumbar spine. That's uh, really interesting. And especially because just the degree of pathology, degenerative pathology in the lumbar spine no patient is really the same. And so obviously having a workhorse approach is very important, but there are certain factors that will steer you in one direction or the other. And to think that even from the lateral approach can be done, that's pretty exciting. Have you heard of uh, any anterior approach being done uh, awake? <laughs> that was my yeah. that was one of my main questions. <laughs> of course. So the, the A-lift procedure, and as we know, people get C-sections under spinal anesthesia. So they're awake for that. So there are many people out there who already are doing that. But essentially, you can do an A-lift awake, you could do an X-lift awake, you could do a uh, T-lift or posterior approach awake. But what's been fascinating to me is this. I think right before COVID, I was invited to be a guest speaker at the uh, Indian Orthopedic Association, their conference. And I remember it was, you know, they had asked me to come speak about uh, my experience doing awake spinal fusion. And they're very respectful over there, especially because I was a foreigner. I got off the stage and um, a gentleman come, came up to me and said, you know, sir, I just want to let you know that we do most of our lumbar procedures awake. I said, okay. I said, single level, two levels? No, no like multi-levels. And what it came down to was that in the places that are far away from the cities, let's say 300 miles away from the big city, they may only have one general anesthesia machine. And the patients have tuberculosis of the spine. They're about to become paralyzed. They need to do the surgery. And so they have no option but to do the surgery awake. And so I've learned now, they say necessity is the mother of invention. And in countries like that, where they don't have the resources we do, they've learned that there are ways that you can do many of these procedures awake. And so the truth is, we really shouldn't be afraid of doing it. People are mm-hmm. doing multi-level lumbar fusions awake. That's that's amazing. And I think that really highlights just the utility of this approach. Obviously, for our modern uh, healthcare system in the U.S., we're very blessed in a, a lot of places to have pretty great resources. And the utility of this approach is pretty obvious, but especially in countries where, like you said, there's maybe one GA machine in the entire hospital. <laughs> I mean, that's... yeah. Incredible. Yeah, to, to expand the uh, access for patients who really need fusion surgery, that's pretty amazing. And so tell us about picking a patient for awake spine surgery. Who's kind of the ideal candidate and uh, what are some factors that might steer you toward or away from the awake approach? Yeah, that's great. That's a great question. You know, early on when we first started doing this, this is about seven, eight years ago that I started doing awake spinal fusion. We were very selective. Perhaps a healthy 40-year-old gentleman who can stand being prone or a same thing with a 50 or 60-year-old. But as our experience got better, as my team and I got better, we realized that we can start doing the awake procedure on people with all different types of comorbidities and all ages. In fact, now we're at the point where we just operated on a gentleman who was 93 years old. He had traveled up from Washington, D.C. to to us for his surgery. And what we're realizing now is that once you have a process in place and you're consistent in your process, any lumbar procedure can be done awake. The only time that we wouldn't do it is if there's an absolute contraindication to spinal anesthesia and if there's an absolute contraindication for them being prone. But as I've learned now, for example, if someone has COPD or some kind of a breathing problem, those patients actually may benefit from being awake so that you can avoid general anesthesia. And so fortunate that I get invited to give a lot of talks on the topic. And I say that, yes, like everything else, there's a learning curve. So you want to start with the straightforward cases in the beginning build up your experience, and as you do, start expanding your indications. Don't go jumping into the deep end straight away. Start slow, build up confidence, build up confidence with the team. And at this point now, I could tell you this, what's remarkable is that we have to convince our patients, but we have to convince our staff why we're not doing it awake because the patients are doing so well after surgery that the nurses in the recovery room would say, why did you not do the surgery awake? For them, it's so much more easier when the patients come in And they're just happy. They have no pain. They don't have that general anesthesia face. You know what I'm talking about? Yes. Yeah. So our hospital staff encourages us because they see the tremendous benefit of doing it this way. 
That's great. That's really great to hear. And so tell us about the patient perspective. So when you're seeing the patient in the office and kind of talking through operation that they need and your approach and everything, when you start talking about awake spine surgery, what's the reaction to that initially? Or do some of the patients kind of know about this? I assume some patients are probably seeking you out because you've made a name for yourself, but surely some patients, when they first hear about this, they kind of you want to put screws in my back while I'm awake? You know? <laughs> <laughs> what am I going to feel? Of course. Yeah. What's the reception of that? And, and, and how do they come around? Yeah. So it's a, it's a great question. And like everything else has been an evolution. So I tend to use the word twilight instead of awake when I speak to the patients. Many patients have had, like, let's say, a colonoscopy and they get twilight anesthesia or they've had a dental procedure and they get twilight anesthesia. So we don't start with the notion of awake because I think there are a lot of bad connotations around that, that I'm going to be awake during my surgery. And I completely understand that. But what we say to the patients is that, you know, nowadays we're able to do surgery under local and regional anesthesia while giving you twilight medicine so that you'll have no recollection of that. When you pose it that way, the patients actually are enthusiastic about that. We've had patients come to us, like you said, because they need spine surgery and they don't want to be intubated. It was interesting because COVID to a large degree helped us because the issues associated with getting intubated were really highlighted during the COVID period. And so now patients, I think, are so much more attuned to the notion that you don't necessarily want to be intubated if you don't have to be. And so as a result, we've had patients, we had a gentleman um, who came to us from Michigan. He had previously had a knee replacement, was intubated, and unfortunately during the intubation had an injury to one of his um, nerves that go to his vocal cord. He just could not be intubated because if he did and they evoked at, they knocked out the other nerve, he would have had difficulty um, breathing and speaking. So he specifically sought us out because he needed to have his spine surgery done under local and regional anesthesia. But what I also say for many other patients is that while the notion of avoiding general anesthesia is what may bring them in, I also say to them that the other benefit is that because we're doing a regional block on top of the spinal anesthesia, using a medicine that lasts for 48 hours, then as a result, you really have minimal pain. And many of our patients take narcotics really just for a few days. I mean, my understanding is the CDC says that about 80 to 90% of patients are on narcotics for four to six weeks after a spinal fusion surgery. That's the national average. On average, our patients are on narcotics for only four days. So for patients who want to have opioid-sparing spine surgery, it's also been a great option for them. That's wonderful. And so it sounds like it's not too onerous to explain to the patient the benefits of this. And so let's, let's actually talk about the day of the surgery. Tell us about uh, what's the setting that you're operating in? Are you in a sort of a acute care hospital setting or, or an ASC? Yeah, I, I'm in both settings. So I work out of a couple of different hospitals and then uh, work out of some ambulatory surgery centers. The ambulatory surgery centers, we typically do the smaller surgeries. So we'll do the awake levonectomy, awake microsectomy, and the awake spinal fusions we're doing in a hospital. And I imagine at some point it'll become routine to do these at a ASC. One thing I want to say is that the day of the hospital is a fairly routine thing. What's not routine, though, is a lot of the counseling and education we do with the patients prior to surgery. So when you're doing outpatient surgery, I think it's really critical that you have many different touch points with the patient, both before and after surgery. But it's really critical for them to understand that we're doing all this so they can mobilize quickly. So we tell the patients that you're going to have your surgery, and four hours later, we're going to get you up and walking, getting ready to go home. And then we tell the patients that you're going to have the twilight anesthesia, and you'll have no recollection of it. And we counsel them on that. It's kind of interesting because we're getting to the point where we're going to start developing a whole pre-op education program and give the patients a virtual reality headset. So they'll be able to walk through the day of surgery and the surgical procedure themselves, be immersed in it. So what we're aiming towards, what we're building right now is a sort of content where patients can wear the headset and that's what their education is going to be. Because in my experience, the more the patient knows and more they can anticipate, and then the greater you can reduce their fear and anxiety going into the surgery, the greater your outcome is going to be. So a lot of times I think that when people think about awake spine surgery, awake spinal fusion surgery, outpatient surgery, they focus on the technical part of it. And by no means am I trying to belittle that, but I don't think people will appreciate how much pre-work goes into it to get the patient's to not only be able to go home the same day, but also have a superior outcome as well. That's really cool. I really like to hear that, especially that part about the the VR. There's a lot of buzz in medicine and especially surgery and, and IR about places where we can integrate VR. And it's more kind of on the operator side is more where we're focusing on it. But I've seen a few things. And then what you've just mentioned now about using it for the patient benefit specifically, that's really fascinating to me because kind of the the notion about uh, surgeons sort of 
practicing through how everything's going to go in their head so that they get to the operating room and kind of doing that, thinking about how that same thing applies for the patient too. So for them to be able to kind of virtually walk into the hospital and to pre-op and know how everything's going to go, it's pretty obvious to think about the benefits that could fall from that. And especially something like this, where, like you said, the counseling is so important to have everyone kind of at the same level and avoid surprises about and, and just have good expectations. It sounds like that's absolutely crucial to the mission. It's absolutely crucial. Yeah, it's it's really interesting. There's so many different avenues about that, because as you know, I, as I mentioned earlier, I got my healthcare MBA up at Dartmouth. And that was at a time when many of the individuals who have developed a lot of these value-based programs were doing work around that. We spent a lot of time talking about outcomes in healthcare and how do you measure it. You know, I think that's, there's a big debate over there. But to me, the best outcome is one where the patient says that they're satisfied and that they want to tell five of their friends about the experience. That's the net promoter score. That's a simple thing. I, we, can, we can talk about what outcome instruments you want till the sun sets. But in my mind, it's about achieving such a great outcome that they want to tell their friends and relatives about the procedure. And doing that, you have to appreciate not only the technical aspects of it, but you have to appreciate some of the emotional aspects about the procedure itself. It's been shown pretty clearly that if patients have a tremendous amount of fear and anxiety going into a surgical procedure, their outcomes are inferior than those who, who didn't. And that's amazing because you could do the best surgery in the world. And I've been there before. I've done the best technical procedure and the patient's like, oh, I don't feel well. I said, yeah, but your, your x-ray looks beautiful. Yeah. <laughs> I've been there before. And now I realize that the missing link is that they weren't there emotionally. And so if you're really trying to aim for an outcome where they want to go out and tell five of their friends, you have to start looking into these factors as well. Oh, that's that's really interesting. Uh, I'm, I think I'm going to be thinking about that for, for the rest of the week. I mean, there's just so much that goes into it. And it's like the old adage is, you know, just any old day at the hospital for us, it may be the scariest day of the patient's life. And especially something that can be as emotionally charged as spine surgery. Uh, I think it makes a lot of sense why the counseling and innovating how we can deliver that in a more optimal way. That's just really interesting. I think the the whole VR topic, I think that could that could be a, a whole episode on its own. We may have to it may have to do. <laughs> we do. Yeah. And I'll, I'll just give you just a brief preview that I am working with a company called Wide Awake VR, who's done a lot of good work on giving people a virtual reality headset. Uh, while having hand surgery awake. And so they've done some good published work now showing how something as simple as hand surgery, where you think the outcomes are pretty straightforward. I mean, how much improvement can you get for hand surgery? Even in that particular scenario, they've shown that when you put them, if you put on a VR headset, let's say they're watching elephants walking through a safari in Africa, that even in that kind of scenario, you can modulate how they feel and then the outcomes as reported by the patients are better, which blew me away because, I, again, I thought that hand surgery, how much more can you, how much more benefit can you get and overall? The outcomes are pretty good. But then you realize when you start adding in the emotional component and how you can modulate that with VR, you start realizing reaching a different level. And that's ultimately at the end of the day, you know, I know many people are fascinated by the notion that I can do the surgery awake and send them home in four hours. But to me, it's going to be really interesting when I can really modulate the experience of the surgery itself so that patients come out and they feel like they had a great time. Let's say they were watching a virtual reality headset while they're having their spine surgery. That to me is the is what we're driving towards now. That's so cool. Yeah, I, I really can't wait to hear how that goes because one of the things I did want to talk to you about and we'll touch on a little bit is kind of the ancillary things in the OR to make the patient feel a little more at ease. And so putting in the VR aspect of that, I just see so many possibilities on that. That's really cool. Really interested to see where that goes in the next few years. So let's talk a little bit about kind of the patient's experience since we're talking about that. So they check into the hospital and what's the process on the day of surgery? Yeah. So the day of surgery, they go through the typical routine of checking into the hospital, getting ready, changing their clothes. I'll meet them obviously outside the operating room. The anesthesiologist will meet with them. Often I'll try to speak to the patient with the anesthesiologist so that they feel comfortable about what we're going to do. And then we roll them in into the operating room. Typically at that point, we may give them some medicine to forget the whole experience. But at that point, what we first start by doing is a spinal anesthesia. So they're sitting up on their stretcher. And as soon as the spinal anesthesia is done, what's neat is the patients actually position themselves prone on the OR table. Now, that's important because we know in spine surgery, being prone has some risks associated with it. If you don't position their arms, they can get brachial plexus injuries. Um, if you don't position their eyes properly, they can get issues with that. And so what's neat about this is that the patient actually positions themselves in a very comfortable manner. 
Um, this goes back to the whole notion of trying to deliver a better experience. But what I learned early on was that when a patient is under general anesthesia, you know, we're taught a different way of sort of how to position the patient. But many people have shoulder problems, rotator cuff issues. And so they may not want to push this in their hands in the way you think they want to, but they want to position their arms in a way that's comfortable for them. And so that's a subtle point, but just understand that you're basically going to help the patient dictate how they're going to feel with their arms during the surgery, which adds to the better experience so that when they wake up, they're not complaining of shoulder pain, even though you did a low back surgery. And that's neat, right? That's a, that was a learning point for me. Many of our patients come in and we ask them to bring in their headphones so they could listen to music. So some patients opt to bring in headphones. And um, at that point, we actually set up their music, which I think is actually really interesting. I've heard some really interesting um, playlists from the patients as a result of that. And then the other thing which is novel and part of the neat thing about the evolution of what we're doing is in spine surgery, we've been slower than the rest of our orthopedic colleagues to adopt these regional blocks. You know, my colleagues who do knee replacements, they do some incredible regional blocks uh, around the knee. But 10 years ago now, there was a paper published around some new regional blocks, which we started adopting. And I use a medicine called Expril, which lasts for 48 hours. So at that point, we do our regional block, which has really been a game changer because these patients wake up with no pain after the spinal fusion. And then we go ahead and do our surgery, which is typically about an hour and a half. And to be honest with you, I don't have anything fancy to do the surgery. Robots, navigation, we use x-ray and just use standard tools. And that's why I always tell people that you really don't need to do anything fancy to be able to achieve a good spinal fusion. Patients are very comfortable. An hour, hour and a half later, when the surgery is done, we've timed our surgeries such that when we give them the spinal anesthesia, the spinal anesthesia wears off typically as the surgery is being completed. So that when we turn them onto their back, they're getting ready to wiggle their toes. And at that point, they know this because we've already cautioned them that a couple hours later, the numbing medicine will wear off. We have a whole protocol that we follow in terms of pain management. And about four hours later, this is the fun part, but four hours later, the nurse will typically get them to sit up and stand up. And that will often be the first time that they stand up with no pain. It's an eye-opening movement. And it's also remarkable to see their faces because they're ready to have pain, right? They just had a spinal fusion. They had screws in their back and they wake up and they say, there's no pain. And that's amazing to see. That's amazing, especially when they've probably been dealing with low back pain for quite some time to kind of flip the switch like that. That's an amazing moment. It's an amazing moment. That's really cool. And so you answered a lot of the questions I had already about in terms of positioning. And it sounds like one of the questions I had is whether patient movement is kind of an issue. And this is something we kind of think about in IR all the time. Uh, certain procedures we're doing, like for example, a lung biopsy, we kind of have to think about okay, can the can we do this under moderate? Is the patient able to hold their breath consistently in these kind of things? Based on what you're saying with uh, the spinal and, and the block, I'm guessing you're probably not having too much issues with the patient kind of truncal movement or anything like that. Or, or are there any issues that may come up related to patient movement? It's a great question because, you know, I'm doing spine surgery. I'm right near the nerves. And if the patient were to move, of course, uh, that could be uh, tragic. You know, this is sort of a fascinating story, but I learned a lot about patient positioning from a patient who I took care of who worked for a mattress company. Now, mattress companies are fascinating because smart mattresses, you know, what's their goal? Their goal is for you to wake up and have a good amount of sleep. And they know that if you, for example, and I forgot the numbers, but they know that if you feel a certain amount of PSI for a certain period of time, let's say 10 PSI for 15 minutes straight, you're more likely to turn over. And they've shown that the more times you turn over, the worse your sleep is. And so smart mattress companies will modulate it so that around minute 12 or 13, they'll decrease the pressure, right? So that it's 8 PSI and that you won't turn over. And they've shown that the more comfortable you make that, less likely to turn over, the better your sleep is. By having the patient position themselves prone, be able to really tell you how comfortable they are, they're less likely to turn over. You don't need to turn over. You don't need to move if you're comfortable. And so in a situation like, let's say what you're describing with the moderate sedation, you have to sort of let the patient pick a comfortable position, an hour or two hours, whatever it's going to be. And of course, you have right material so that they're not honestly on a hard surface. And if you do that, you'll be surprised how how still the patients can be if they're comfortable. Yeah, absolutely. Are there any um, implements, you know, different people have different things, you know, like the kind of the jello uh, mold or just folded pillows or anything like that? Any Any kind of things that 
use in the operating room to help the patient get positioned in a comfortable manner? Yeah, it's a great question. And I think that honestly, it would be the business plan to create better materials that patients can have to make them comfortable. Uh, we don't use anything fancy, not yet. At least right now, we use the typical cushions associated with that. And then the biggest thing is uh, we use a Wilson frame, which is very comfortable. It also, it's opened. So then they're not feeling the pressure too much over there. And then the other thing is that if we do think the patient is going to feel uncomfortable, in the middle of the case, we'll ask them, do you want to adjust yourself? So we stop and the patient can adjust themselves and put themselves back into a better position. Nice. That's good. Yeah. That actually uh, brings up one question that I had. You sort of alluded to this is pretty much going to be one or two level uh, surgery. And I was just kind of wondering, is there a, a way that uh, navigation or robotics could fit into this picture? Because obviously with navigation typically starts with uh, if, you're, if you're doing like an O-arm CT acquisition at first, a problem we run into with some of our uh, interventions in IR where we may start with a cone beam CT and and then do kind of guidance type of things as if the patient moves, it's kind of that yeah. CT may may no longer be useful. So that was kind of one of the issues I, I saw potentially related to that. Is there a way that you think navigation could be uh, ultimately implemented with awake surgery? Yeah, it already is. I have a colleague down at the Mayo in Florida, another colleague at Duke who are doing um, awake robotic surgery. So they're already using the robot to navigate the screws and they've shown really clearly, I don't think they're using the O-arm, but they're getting their image, image acquisition in other ways. But regardless, they're able to put in the screws using um, the robot. So you can foresee that, right? Doing a multi-level fusion won't be a problem. Yeah. Because the robot, obviously they're very quick in putting their screws in so that it won't be a problem to be able to do an L1 to S1 fusion with the robot. That's amazing. That's really cool. And so uh, most of what you're doing, uh, like you said, is kind of like one or two level uh, lumbar fusion. And so typically, uh, how long is the operation lasting for? And then you say you get the patient in the PACU and then uh, what's their typical stay? I know you, you alluded to some of this earlier. Sure. Yeah. So my practice is such, I don't typically do deformity surgery. I used to in my previous life, but um, I don't anymore. So the majority of the patients I take care of have single level or, or um, multi-level disease. So that's typically an hour, hour and a half surgery. And then they're typically in the recovery room for four hours is what we aim for. We have a whole protocol so that at hour one, we do one thing, at hour two, we do another three, four. The reason why I keep on bringing up the four hour issue is because they've shown in the ambulatory surgery world, ASC, that the cost effectiveness of a procedure starts to diminish after four hours. So you want to, if you want to define your efficiency, you want to basically be able to discharge the patient's home by four hours on average. That's why our protocol is designed that way. And then they typically go home, they walk home, and they walk the next day and, um, you know, my staff and I are very good about calling the patients either the day of, the next day. And as I was mentioning before, you have to have multiple touch points with the patient, especially since they went home the same day, sort of coaching them through their period, how to get through their pain, any issues they deal with. And that typically for the first 24 to 48 hours is probably the most intense period, but then it really drops off after that. I know that patients don't require pain meds after about four to five days for two reasons. One is that we have the state database. So we can see if they're getting medicines from anybody else. And the two, I typically only write them for pain meds for about four or five days. So I'm the one giving the phone calls if they need more medicine. So it's a fairly consistent number that they only require pain meds for that short period of time, which is great, which is great. And I can foresee that there'll be a time when we can make this an opioid, a complete opioid sparing surgery. I mean, to think that we could do a spinal fusion and not do opioids, that's not going to be too hard of a challenge to do. We'll get there in time. Yeah, and definitely would be a game changer. Uh, obviously, everyone's very focused on the risks of opioids. And a lot of the research has shown that if it's used, you know, for acute pain related to surgery, the risks of chronic dependence are low. But obviously, just minimizing that as much as possible is the goal, I think. So tell us a little bit about what's kind of the typical post-operative pain regimen that you're sending patients home with. What we typically do is give them some type of opioid whether it be a Vicodin or a Percocet. We give them a uh, muscle relaxant. We give them antibiotics and we give them stool softener. So that was sort of an interesting thing that we picked up on is that especially elderly gentlemen, they tend to, tend to have problems with uh, bowel function after surgery. So we actually start them on stool softeners prior to surgery. And that's made a big difference so that they have less problems after surgery. That regimen is maintained for about a week with in terms of the uh, stool softener. But in terms of the pain management, it's typically for 48 hours, we get the narcotics and the muscle relaxant. And we're on day three and day four is when they really start to slow down. And they typically see us in the office about a week after surgery. At that point, they're not taking much for medicine. At most, they'll be taking like a Tylenol extra strength. 
That's that's pretty amazing. Just to say that the, within the, a week of spine surgery, the patient will just be taking Tylenol. I'm sure you can probably compare that to some of your earlier experiences and with operating on patients before in kind of the old way of GA and being on longer courses of medication. I imagine that must be pretty amazing. <laughs> it's, you know, it's it's neat on a couple of levels. One is that our data right now for full transparency, our last review is that 70% of patients are off of narcotics after one week from surgery. And the 30% who are not, who are still on opioids, were opioid dependent prior to surgery. So we're not at 100%. And so if you're opioid naive prior to surgery, by one week's time, great confidence that you'll be off of narcotics. But more than anything else, the beautiful thing about the whole thing is that I get less phone calls after surgery because the patients aren't yeah. in, <laughs> the patients aren't in pain anymore, <laughs> yeah. and that's been that's yeah. been a game changer for me. <laughs> yeah, that's great, and I mean, obviously, the patient, you know, patients love not having to call the office because they're not having an issue. So it's that's a win win. <laughs> <laughs> it's a win win that way. Yeah. So what have been some maybe unexpected challenges or pleasant surprises implementing the awake practice? That's a great question. You know, from a technical point of view, our protocol is down. And the bigger challenge is dealing with the cultural issues. And what I mean by that is the resistance to change from, let's say, my anesthesiologist or people in the, in the OR and trying to figure out how to win them over. I've had the chance now to do awake spine surgery at multiple different hospitals. So I'm not just with one place. And I've had to learn change management in this context. To me, that's been the hardest things. I know that this is a better way of doing spine surgery, but the person at the other end behind the drape doesn't. And so trying to sort of work with them and convince them that this is the right way to do it. You know, where, where it's becoming really interesting for me is that I've had a chance now to teach the technique to people across the country and across the world. And I just recently had some visitors from um, Oxford, England come over. And um, the English healthcare system is very regimented, very standardized, very protocol based. Um, it's pr quite incredible, very resistant to change for that reason. And it's been interesting for me to not really think about how people are doing awake spine surgery in these countries, but how they're dealing with the cultural change issues, the change management issues. And each place is unique and different, but I'm proud to say that now they've done about 30 awake spine surgeries in Oxford, and it took them a while. It wasn't an issue about the technical part of it. Everyone knows how to do the spinal and the block. It was an issue of doing the surgery. It was an issue of getting everyone to come on board to the idea. So that's been the biggest challenge that I've seen with all this. It's just managing change. And that's something that it just takes time, I, I think, you know, and it's been interesting. I've noticed comparable things just even in my training is that you can see, uh, oh, why do we do something this way? And everyone will kind of shrug their shoulder. I don't know. It's, just, <laughs> it's how, how it's been since I've been a resident here and now, and then I was a fellow and now I'm an attending here and we still <laughs> do it that way. And yeah. Uh, so, yeah, there's, there's a lot of inertia. Did you have kind of some strategies toward getting people on? I mean, surely a lot of it is just kind of doing one case at a time and people will come around once they see that the, the outcomes are superior and, and the benefits to it. That initial push, though, can be quite difficult. Were there uh, some sort of strategies that you employed maybe when you were doing your first awake case at, at a hospital? Anything that you found to be particularly effective? Yeah, I, mean, I, I think a couple of things. One is that from my personal perspective, I tended to try to find anesthesiologists who are very comfortable doing spinals. So particularly the ones who do um, OBGYN, they feel be more comfortable. And then generally the younger anesthesiologists tend to be a little bit more open to change, not too young, but a little open to trying it out. So I've been lucky that I've been able to find those people pretty quickly. So I don't need to spend too much time convincing them and really just working on more of the technical part. But in the larger context, you know, at Dartmouth, we learned about the innovation curve and the adoption of innovation, Moore's um, curve, essentially. So now when I teach people, a lot of times people will call me and ask me about the technique and whatever. And I actually put a pause and I, I try to really understand where they are in that adoption curve. Are they the innovators or early adopters or are they a laggard? Because then I know, look, if you're a laggard and you, or if you're surrounded by laggards, you're not going to be doing this. And so for me, it's been really helpful to sort of segment my student, if you will, and be able to teach them accordingly. Because for some people I can say, you know, look, I want to teach you how to do an awake spinal fusion. Or for some people I say, look, just do an awake laminectomy on a 30 year old gentleman with a herniated disc and just do that 20 times. Because if you don't get confidence in your OR team, it's going to be really hard for you to move forward. And that's been a really good learning curve. You know, we're working a lot right now on scaling up what we do via courses and lectures. And so I've learned a lot about the adoption of innovation as a result of all this. Fantastic. 
What were some maybe unexpected pleasant surprises you've had during all of this? You mentioned the uh, fewer phone calls, which is which is great. <laughs> uh, anything else? You know, there's been this has been so many, but you know, as I said before, my goal is to make surgery a pleasant experience. There's been so many patients who I've seen who avoid surgery because of the notion of surgery. And I get it. I mean, having surgery is not the first thing you think about. But one of the nice compliments I've had is um, patients who I've done, let's say, an L5 S1 laminectomy on them. They did great. I did it awake. And two, three, four years later, they may develop lemonec- uh, spinal stenosis two levels above, L3, 4. And I say, okay, let's do physical therapy. Maybe we'll do an injection. But oftentimes they'll come back and be like, you know, surgery was such a good experience. Why don't we just rush into surgery and do that? Because we know it's going to work. And that just shows me that basically we made it such a good experience that there's no fear. They're willing to skip the line and go straight to surgery. Yeah. Well, that that's really huge because... I'm sure you encounter this quite a bit, patients who've been operated on by other surgeons. And I've even had it some as patients said, oh yeah, I, I had spine surgery. And it, you know, the way they talk about it is not as glowing as what you're talking about. So to be able to turn something like that, that can potentially be quite an unpleasant experience and memory into something that they're like, hey, let's just do it. Let's just take care of it because we know it's going to be, it's not going to be a bad experience and it'll work. That's fantastic. Exactly. And that's what our goal is, right? Because I can tell you so many stories of people who avoided surgery and they got worse just because of the fear of surgery. Yeah. So if we can make it a good experience, that won't be an issue. Definitely. One thing I'd like to hear about, and your perspective on this is so valuable because of your background in healthcare administration and your perspective from that level. What role do you think awake surgery is going to play in the changing American healthcare system? And specifically, we have uh, an aging and sicker population. And uh, do you think that more surgeons are going to need to incorporate this to take the best care of their patients? Yeah, I think so. That's, that's a great question. And it could be answered on so many levels. But at a very basic level, as the population ages, the demand for spine surgery will increase. That's just normal wear and tear. And so we're going to need to come up with a more cost-efficient way of doing spine surgery. So moving it from inpatient to outpatient is one, uh, moving from general anesthesia to regional anesthesia is two, making it safer in terms of less opioids. We've already published a paper showing that when you do the surgery awake versus general, with the laminectomy, there's cost savings. And then we have some prelim data that for the fusions, of course, it's tremendous Tremendous savings. The number is anywhere from 30 to 50%, depending on how you look at it. So no question that it's a cost-effective solution. So it's like the hip and knee replacement world. I mean, more patients will undergo hip and knee replacements. You want to do it in a cost-effective way. Otherwise, we're going to bankrupt the system. So I would guess that a lot of change is going to happen when it becomes patient-driven. And to some degree, the insurance companies will follow. So I can foresee a time when patients will want their surgery to be done awake. So that's going to cause surgeons to, to learn the technique. And then the insurance companies will ask for it as well because they'll say, hey, look, we're seeing that our data is such that these patients are doing better. We're not going to authorize the surgery. This is scary, but we're not going to authorize the surgery unless it's being done using this uh, awake protocol. So I can foresee that those are the two drivers that are going to change it. Surgeons, young surgeons will want to adopt it because it leads to the fast recovery. But from what I can see across the country and really across the world now, it's patient demand, which is really causing the change. And then it will soon be insurance driven as well. Yeah. Really, really interesting to think about that. I, and from what I can understand, the snapshot where we are right now, you kind of talked about the Moore's curve. We're still on the relatively early end of that. I think it's going to be very interesting over the next few years to see the propagation of this technique. Uh, but for all the benefits that you talked about, it's it's clear to me, it's, it's definitely going to spread. On that note, you have some words of uh, wisdom and advice to surgeons who are thinking of incorporating this, and uh, maybe more importantly, any any thoughts for the the naysayers? <laughs> <laughs> and there's a lot of naysayers. It's okay to be a naysayer. Look, at the end of the day, it's the goal is to get a good outcome, right? As long as you're getting a good outcome in a safe manner, it's perfectly fine. The challenge becomes when there's a better way of doing things, and that's going to happen. And we shouldn't be afraid of change, right? We shouldn't be afraid of progress. That's the only way that the country will advance. It's the only way we're going to become better. And I would argue that's what the goal of value-based care is, to sort of move that direction. In terms of surgeons who want to learn the technique, I've got to do a better job of creating courses. And I've just been so busy with my prior practice that I haven't done that. But we're in the process now of trying to develop some courses around this because there is a lot of interest, not only across the U.S., but really across the world, because I found that 
the same challenges that we have over here, countries across the world like England, Spain, Italy, India, Vietnam are having the same kind of challenges. So in due time, um, we have to do a better job of teaching people in a way that's scalable. Uh, that's what my next challenge is going to be with all this beyond developing the virtual reality headset and all the other things that we're doing as well. Yeah, uh, with all your abundant free time. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, no, it's it's really cool to hear about this because... You know, when first hearing about this, it, it just kind of seemed like, okay, yeah, that's kind of a cool thing, you know, and sort of in the OR. But then as you've talked about this, it's clear it's so much more than that. It goes deep into the healthcare systems, goes into the patient experience before and after. Uh, and there's a lot that kind of needs to be tuned up. I really look forward to hearing about this as, as it propagates. And, and uh, really thank you for coming in sharing your thoughts on this. I mean, I thank you again. This is a great podcast and I really enjoyed this conversation. It, what I want to point out is that it, it's not just a surgical technique, right? It's about delivering a better experience. Ultimately, that's what my goal is, is when people ask me what's the end point, my goal is that someone comes out of spine surgery and says, that was a great experience. And if we could achieve that, whatever mechanism is going to be, minimizing opioids, minimizing pain, virtual reality, that would be success in my mind. Beautiful. One thing that I like to ask all my guests is obviously you have a lot of passion about this topic and awake spine surgery, but what's the number one biggest thing in medicine that's exciting you right now, whether that's an aspect of this or something totally separate, what's really getting you excited right now? You know, what's really exciting right now is this whole chat GPT and adaptive AI. Oh yeah. I, I cannot wrap my head around it yet to understand how it's going to be used. I mean, there's so many different ways it's going. And then the fact is that there's pushback on it too. I think it's very exciting. I, I don't know where it's going to go. I think it's good. I think we got to figure out what, which direction it's going to go. There's going to be a lot of ethical and regulatory issues that come up with it. But to me, that's really going to be pushing the needle more than anything else right now in healthcare. Yeah, that's, that's a really cool topic. And that's one that I, you know, I just keep seeing so much around LinkedIn. I'm like, man, I really got to start learning about <laughs> this because it's it's just accelerating so quickly. It'd be really cool to see where that goes. And I'm sure it has some applications to awake spine surgery as well. So <laughs> Absolutely. It will. I'm sure. I just haven't figured it out yet. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, we'll ask Chat GPT what are the applications <laughs> in awake spine surgery. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Well, Dr. Exactly. Sharam, thank you so much for your time. I really enjoyed our conversation. Really hope to have you back on the show in the future. L would love to hear more about the VR as that develops. Thank you so much for your time. So before we sign off, where can listeners kind of keep up with you and, and learn more about awake spine surgery if they're so interested? Thank you. First of all, again, thank you again. Great podcast, great conversation. Uh, we have a website called awakespinalfusion.com. I try to do a good job of updating it so we could put more information on. We actually did create an online learning platform called DocSocial, D-O-C dot social. If people go there, there's actually some lectures and a course that we put up there as sort of a beginner attempt to sort of uh, learning about that. So, and then LinkedIn, of course, we do a lot of work. LinkedIn's a great professional platform. So I do try to put up articles from others who are doing research around it. I find that to be a very helpful resource for getting information. So those are really the three main places where I would say people can go to to get more information. Fantastic. Well, again, Dr. Sharon, thank you so much. I will look forward to having you back on the show in the future. And to our listeners, thanks for tuning in and uh, we'll catch you all next time. Thank you. Thank you so much for listening. If you haven't already, make sure to subscribe, rate the podcast five stars, and share with a friend. If you have any questions or comments, direct message us at at underscore Backtable on Instagram, Twitter, or LinkedIn. Backtable is produced and hosted by myself, Aaron Fritz, and co-hosts Chris Beck, Sabine Don, Michael Barraza, Jacob Fleming, and Ali Behetti. Our audio team is led by Kieran Gannon with support from Josh McWhorter, Aaron Bowles, Nick Shellcross, and Ness smith Savadoff. Design and digital marketing led by Brian Schmitz. Article and transcript support by Taylor Robinson. And Delaney Aguilar. Social media and PR by Ann Dang. Administrative support provided by Jim Roy Kinnebrew. Intro and extra music is Ripperoo by Skeptic Moon. Find us on Spotify or at local live music venues in New Orleans, Louisiana. Thanks again for listening. 